Uh, we had a very festive night last night, and I'm sure we're all recovering from it. Um, and this conference is structured in a, in a leg with a leisurely pace in mind. Uh, every paper has about an hour devoted to it, and we don't have to, so we don't have to be so kind of um, uh, punctual with everything, but nonetheless, we should probably get started right now. Um, so this is the first, uh, first proper session of the conference, I guess. We'll be uh, having contributions from Peter Schutzer and Olivier Precht. Um, the way the format for these um, sessions will be structured is that each contributor will have about an hour devoted to uh, their paper. They can kind of divide that hour the way they want a little bit. Um, hopefully they won't speak for the whole hour, but we give them a certain amount of latitude, 20, 25, 30 minutes, whatever. Uh, and then we can have uh, question and answers um, after that. And then at, once the hour is over, um, or possibly a little bit less than an hour now, um, we'll move on to the next um, paper. So our first paper today uh, will be by uh, Peter Schulz, who is a uh, professor of Lusitanistic or Brazilianistic uh, at the Universität zu Köln. Um, he's a um, specialist on, as I just learned, Brazilian cinema, but also Brazilian literature and, uh, and, and other media and arts. And his paper title is, and forgive me for the uh, pronunciation of this uh, lengthy neologism, Brasilio Cartesio Machias, is that okay? <laughs> Colonial history and post-68 counterculture in Paolo Leminski's Nouvelle Catatau. So I'll hand over to Peter. Well, thank you kindly for the introduction and also to the invitation. Um, it's really, I've said that yesterday already, but uh, I truly do, um, you know, appreciate and, and, and very much admire the program you've mounted. This is absolutely astonishing and um, this uh, truly is the biggest uh, event on Cinema Marginal ever. No doubt about it and for a whole year, so this is great. Uh, I'm very happy to be here and you really managed to pronounce it correctly. It's a bit of a tongue breaker and it's one of these many neologisms. That, uh, uh, that Paulo Leminski really uses in, uh, in this book, uh, which is Catatau, Un Humance Idea. And um, the Curitiban uh, born Paulo Leminski is really one of the most flamboyant figures of Brazilian contracultura of the 1970s and 80s. That's why it's the post 68. And we've talked about that yesterday, that 68 was maybe in Brazil not really happening in the spirit of 68 in Europe. There was a lot of repression as well, so um, we've discussed on that yesterday. But um, tellingly, um, two of the very prominent uh, figures of, let's see if this works actually. Yeah. Well, here you see Paulo Liminski again, and um, also quite in the spirit of post-68, I suppose. Um, but prominently, too, of the, um, of the protagonists of, uh, of the uh, Contra Cultura music, Caetano Veloso and Moraes Moreira, who was one of the main musicians of the Novos Baianos, um, have actually adapted some of his poems. And uh, Paolo Liminski, I'll give you that image again, which I like, uh, was highly productive and also versatile. Um, he was a poet and a novelist, an essayist and a translator, as well as a judoka. You see some reminiscences, reminiscences there. A musician and also a host of an experimental TV show. Leminski's magnum opus is Catatau un Romance Idea, published in 1975 in an author's edition independent of the established publishers. Written throughout the course of almost a decade, the experimental novel epitomizes um, essential traits of post-68 counterculture in Brazil. Catatau undermines the ideology of the modernização conservadora as systematically propagated by the right-wing military dictatorship based on positivist notions of modernity and progress, 
rationality and nationalism. This seems eclectic, but it's really part of the program, actually, in this kind of mixture. Manifest both in the regime's propaganda and cultural politics. And um, maybe a very short comment, they actually really financed the military um, dictatorship. A lot of culture productions, um, like uh, Independencia ou Morte, for example, uh, which was a film by Carlos Coimbra, and they were actually really, in these um, um, Latin years, they were really, um, they were really having this cultural politics of, of also glorifying the past. So this is quite an important context also for Catatau, as you will see. Um, the minimal plot of Catatau is quickly outlined. In the short-lived 17th century colony called Dutch Brazil, the fictionalized French philosopher René Descartes is waiting under the tree in the botanical garden of Mauritzstadt, nowadays Recife, for the vice governor of the colony who comes by staggering drunkenly towards the end of the novel. While the histoire is focusing on the weight, the discours consists of the protagonist's meandering stream of consciousness interspersed with appropriations of numerous pretexts from the colonial discourse on Brazil, as well as references to the present of the country in the mid-70s. Through the stream of consciousness, the novel critically converges to colonial history of Brazil with that of the capital city of Brasilia, inaugurated in 1960, and turned into the seat of government of the military regime only four years later. Catatau's counter-cultural approach is apparent in the plot, reduced to complete stasis diametrically opposed to the action-based ideology of progress and economic growth propagated by the military regime, lacking any substantial advance of the living conditions of the lower strata of Brazilian society, marked by extreme structural inequality. The contracultura is also palpable in the protagonist's stream of consciousness, altered by the consumption of psychedelic substances, causing him to traverse the doors of perception, to use the phrasing of Aldous Huxley's eponymous essay. Besides these rather obvious affinities to hippie and psychedelic culture, or subculture rather, the contracultura also manifests itself in the deeper structure of catatau. As I aim to show via intertext references, Leminski systematically appropriates Eurocentric discourses and epistemologies related to the colonial history of Brazil still present during the so-called Anus de Chumbo, the post-68 Latin years of the military dictatorship, during which Catatau was written. The novel's particular aesthetics of appropriation are in line with tropicalist counterculture, including the affinity for Osvaldo de Andrade's Anthropophagia, based on the juxtaposition of contrasting discourses and verbal registers as a means of demystifying both neocolonial and nationalist ideologies strongly propagated by the military regime. In the case of Catatau, the contrasting dimensions are manifest in two areas of tension. On the one hand, between the sophisticated literature of a poeta doctus and the use of colonial, uh, colloquial, uh, sorry, colloquial language, including obscenities and corny jokes. On the other hand, between the neo-baroque verbal abundance and a reduction of the written word to its materiality, in the spirit of concrete poetry. And he was actually, you've mentioned that, uh, Vincent, yesterday, that actually there is a genealogy uh, between the concrete poets and um, the tropicalia movement and 
uh, Katatao and its author Paolo Leminski was actually also um, uh, also being embraced by the group of uh, of the um, of uh, the, the uh, Gicampo brothers and uh, De Supinatari. And he was really, as a very young man, um, he he, um, he he published even in their um, in their magazine some of his poets poems already in his twenties. But um, coming back to the stylistic heterogeneity, um, this is not just a formal trait, but rather, as I would argue, a highly complex form of post-colonial thinking, capable of reflecting upon the discursive formations of os Brasils, as Darcy Ribeiro has aptly called the heterogeneous Brazil in its plural form. Coming back to the plot of Catatau, about halfway through the novel, a formulation arising from protagonist René Descartes' stream of consciousness may serve as an example of the aesthetics of the novel, implying an ironical reflection both on the storytelling of Katatau and on certain Eurocentric <clears throat> epistemes at work in the interpretation of Brazil. I'm referring to the phrase Faço tabula da fabula rasa, a paradigmatic example for the witty resignification frequently employed in Katatau. The phrase evidently evokes the expression tabula rasa in the sense of I am making tabula rasa of the fable. However, through a permutation of words, the expression tabula rasa is crossed with the term fable. Therefore, the fictional Descartes turns fabula rasa, meaning flat or shallow story, into a tabula. The polysemic Latin word for slate, painting, map, certificate, document, register, index, protocol, and account book. While a tale is being called shallow in an ironic way, it is in fact extremely complex and overdetermined. The phrase in question is highly significant in regards to colonial history of Brazil and respective Eurocentric ideologies. As already mentioned, the story of Catatau is set in New Holland, the short-lived Dutch colony, conquered from the Portuguese colonizers uh, between 1630 and 1655. In Leminski's novel, Descartes finds himself in the botanical garden of Johann Moritz, Prince of Nassau-Siegen, general governor of the estate of the Dutch West India Company as well. Significantly, Johann Moritz brought a whole armada of scientists and artists to the Dutch colony. Among them, the cartographer, botanist and astronomer, Georg Markgraf, the doctor, Willem Piso, the painter and architect, Peter Post, as well as the painters Albert Eckhut and Franz Poss. They recorded and collected information on geography and climate, flora and fauna, and on the colony's indigenous population, generating knowledge and exploiting the country, all in service to the Dutch colonial power. With all this in mind, Faso Tabula da Fabula Rasa seems like an ironic commentary on the colonialist exploration of Brazil by using techniques such as recording, surveying, mapping, and categorizing, all of which are implied in the Latin word of tabula. Whereas the colonial discourse, critically reflected in Catatau, is dominated by a hegemonic epistemology with emphasis on denotation and truth, Leminski's Humanse Idea, however, is characterized by a complex orchestration of subaltern epistemologies with emphasis on performance and transformation. And I'm not going to, unfortunately, dwell into this because of a lack of time, but there is a marvelous, um, um, a, a marvelous set of paratexts, actually, some mottos at the beginning of the novel, and they actually lead to some of 
the parts inside of the book. So you're basically going to and fro, breaking with the linearity of the novel in various ways, and also establishing uh, some other uh, intertextual references, all doing a kind of um, a kind of deconstruction of the of the colonial archive um, of Brazil. Um, but again, I won't be able to dwell into that. What is uh, characteristic, though, is the extreme poeticity and performativity of language, already manifest in the programmatic title of the book. The word katatau, probably of onomatopoetic origin, is one of the most polysemic words in Portuguese. Catatau can be translated as one of the most, uh, as something very small and very big. It can mean beating, punishment, or penis, playing card, or old rapier, among other connotations. And besides, actually, one reference there, and the, 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 his biographer Tony Vaz wrote about this, that in um, his hometown, Curitiba, uh, Liminski was running around for years with uh, a bunch of papers because he was doing notes everywhere he went, in bars and whatnot, public spaces as well. And uh, the people, and mainly his friends, they were saying, oh, there comes Liminski with his katatau which was like this bundle of, you know, uh, of uh, his notes. So that's uh, like a, a reference to the actual um, genesis, so to say, the aesthetic genesis, the production aesthetics in a way. But um, besides the, um, the words uh, appear also in various idioms, such as ugly as a katatau. Significantly, these expressions are regional and colloquial instead of having standardized meanings that could be found in common dictionaries. Colloquial language and region-specific expressions form a substantial part of Katatau's vocabulary, frequently in combination and in contrast with erudite terms and words from various languages. Correspondingly, Katatau also means discurso prolongado, meaning something like a long speech. And zuha, yet another polysemic, polysemic uh, and onomatopoetic word with um, translations such as noise, babble, of voices, buzzing or humming, as well as teasing or mess. Catatau in the sense of the discurso prolongado combined with the zuha strikingly characterizes Liminski's novel signifying both the protagonist's incessant stream of consciousness and a babble of voices heard through his speech, particularly the countless intertextual references. The many pretexts appropriated in Catatau include René Descartes' philosophy, particularly two publications, the Principia Philosophe, and the discourse on the method of rightly conducting one's reason and of seeking truth in the sciences, in which he develops for the first time his philosophical principle, je pense donc je suis. Descartes postulates a thinking independent from body and environment, supposedly constitutive of the ego. The primacy of reason goes hand in hand with a categorical dismissal of the senses and imagination as a means of understanding. Catatau begins with the word ergo sum alias ego sum Renatus Catesius. Evidently, this is an intertextual reference to the well-known ego cogito ergo sum, the foundation of Cartesian metaphysics. Leminski programmat uh, programmatically omits the crucial ego cogito, the homance idea begins with therefore I am, thus referring not to a thinking subject, but to a vacancy. Instead of Cartesian self-empowerment of the subject through its thinking, the fictive Renatus Cartesius constitutes being lost nesse labirinto de enganos deleitáveis, that is, in the labyrinth of delightful illusions. 
In what follows, the missing cogito is replaced by the verb vejo, I see, which is repeated three times, referring to different elements of a coastal landscape, followed by the phrase vejo mais, I see more. Both the dominance of sensory perception and the loss of certainty through thought become manifest in the protagonist's view through the optical instrument, Lynch's Giluneta, a telescope with variable lenses. The medial enhanced sight in a pseudomimetically, is pseudomimetically expressed in the typeface. When the sentence continues in capital letters, after the lentis di luneta, as a typographic correspondence to the magnification of the telescope. Do parque do príncipe, a lentis di luneta, contemplo a considerar o cais, o mar, as nuvens, os enigmas e os prodígios de Brasília. The medialized perception, however, hardly leads to ontological certainties, or at least a taxonomy of the visible. Since not just K, C, and clouds seem magnified, but also the enigmas and prodigies of Brasilia. Reason hardly appears as a, and I quote, universal instrument at hand at any time, this is from the discours, from uh, Descartes' discours, as postulated by the philosopher. This becomes clear in the phrase, contemplo a considerar. The quasi synonymous words, contemplar e considerar, can both mean reflect, think about, consider, as well as watch or look at, thus invoking a impenetrable blend of perception and thinking. Contrary to Descartes' postulate, the protagonist's thinking is not at all independent from his body and his surroundings, but is indeed influenced substantially by his sensory perception. While looking through a telescope, he exposed to an omnipresent steam, a bafo, which seems to be affecting his stream of consciousness and is expressed in an increasing poeticity of language, characteristic for Katatau. And I'm going to give you a little example here. O vapor umedece o bolor, abafa o mofo, asfixia e fermenta fragmentos de fragrâncias, cheiro, um palmo à frente do nariz, mim, imenso e imerso, bom. This immersive sensory perception of a variety of odors combined with olfactory self-awareness seems to be intensified by the protagonist's smoking of ervas de negros and tabaqueação de tupinambu, apparently psychedelic substances stemming from non-European traditions. Pipe and telescope appear as insignia of a philosopher affected by a sensory perception, expressing, expressing the physicality of his thinking in his stream of consciousness as a swan song for the abstract, supposedly universal reason of ego cogito ergo sum, which turns out to be inadequate for the understanding of Brazil, of course, in the novel of Catatau. Significantly, the product, protagonist Descartes uses the word Brasilia for Brazil. He thus refers to today's capital city of Brazil, inaugurated in 1960 by President Juscelino Kubitschek um, with his program of cinco anos de progresso em, uh, 50 anos de progresso em cinco, desculpa. <laughs> Essa seria uma deconstrução no sentido de Leminski está catatão, né? Essa inversão, mas não. Uh, and shortly after becoming the seat of the government to the military regime, whereas the story of Catatau, as I have mentioned, is set in the 17th century colony of Dutch Brazil. This particular regime of time corresponds with the perspective of sociologist Octavio Yanni on modern Brazil, and I cite, uma história na qual a modernidade está mesclada no caleidoscópio 
dos pretéritos, dos ciclos desencontrados de tempos e lugares, como se o presente fosse um depósito arqueológico de épocas e regiões. The coexistence of varying times and places mentioned by Yanni is not only manifest in the convergence of the capital city of Brasilia with the colony of Dutch Brazil. The sighted kaleidoscope of the preterite combined with the prism of the present is in fact a structural feature of the Homansi idea. This becomes evident in the novel's varying language registers. There are numerous words and phrases in Latin, as well as expressions and sentences in Tupi, Dutch, German, French, Polish, etc., etc. Sometimes even in the archaic versions of 17th century. All language by, languages, by the way, spoken by immigrants to Mauritstadt, today's Recife in 17th century. At the same time, the text is full of expressions that did not emerge until the second half of the 20th century, especially from Brazilian colloquial languages, first and foremost idioms, word plays, and a lot of obscenities, but also elements of numerous foreign languages, ranging from slang to standard and sophisticated expressions. Characteristic to the meta-reflective dimension of katatau, this aesthetic process is referred to playfully, for instance, in the following sentence. Da obra dos outros, como objet trouvé, finders, goalkeepers, jaspers, lousy whispers. And there are actually a whole almost pages, or at least um, uh, uh, lines and lines in, in, in Latin and in, in a lot of different languages. So this is uh, a, a, quite a, serious, um, quite a ser serious obstacle for people who are not um, really uh, fluent in a lot of languages, so to say. In Katatau, Liminski explores the possibilities of an extreme variability and poeticity of language. This particular language corresponds with the protagonist's thinking of difference and the torn stream of consciousness in Katatau, which is expressed in the kaleidoscopic regimes of time as well as rhizomatic paratextual compositions. Confronted with manifestations of Brazil, reason fails the protagonist. Este mundo é o lugar do desvario. A justa razão aqui delira. Meaning, this world is a place. This world is a place of lunacy. The right reason here is delirious. In contrast to the Cartesian method, with its foreground rules of analytical thinking that build on another, the protagonist frequently combines terms to ambiguous portmanteaus in a stream of consciousness including blends of subject and object of examination. In one word, such as in the exclamation, Brasilia Cartesio Maquias, a combination of Brasilia, Cartesian, and makeup. This portmanteau seems to express fictive Descartes' inability to make sense of the manifestations of Brazil. The failure of Cartesian thinking resonates with the protagonist appearing as a post-colonial counter-image to the common colonizer, instead of conquest by sword and cross. He patiently waits under a tree from which a sloth is dropping feces in his mouth. To sum up, Katatau deconstructs what Glauber Hoscha called racionalismos colonizadores, that is, colonialist rationalisms by means of an extreme, and I mentioned this before, poeticity and performativity of language, inserting a thinking of difference into fictive Descartes' stream of consciousness that poses also an immense hermeneutic challenge to the readers. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, I'll welcome up now uh, Oliver Precht, uh, he is a philosopher and writer based in Berlin, but who teaches philosophy in Munich. 
So I imagine the op recent opening of the new high-speed train line has made life significantly easier for Oliver. Uh, but he um, is particularly, uh, I guess, pertinent for this conference in the sense that he is also a translator from Portuguese into German and has recently translated Osvaldo Andrade's uh, Manifeste and Eduardo Viveiros de Castro's uh, The Unbeständigkeit der Wilden Seele in the last couple of years. Um, so I will welcome Oliver if, if the PowerPoint system is working okay, uh, up to the lectern. egg, dear colleagues, is a thing that must be careful. That's why the chicken is the egg's disguise. The chicken exists so that the egg, yeah, thank you, so that the egg can traverse the ages. That's what the mother is there for. The egg is constantly persecuted for being too ahead of its time. An egg for now will always be revolutionary. Most of you will have recognized um, this quotation from a short but very important text by the famous Jewish-Brazilian writer Clarice Lispector. The text is called The Egg and the Chicken. And this text is all I want to talk about today. According to the title of this conference, um, we are here because we want to talk and learn about the other 68, about one or several revolutions that may or may not have occurred in Brazil. To say the least, it's not obvious how we could expect to learn anything about this other 68 by talking about a strange short story by Clarice Lispector. But on the other hand, we can only truly learn something about, and especially from, this other 68 if we allow it to turn out to be something completely different from what we expected. It may turn out um, that the revolution we encounter is quite different from our concept of revolution. It may even turn out that, that it is a revolution of our concept of revolution and of our concept of politics in general. So what do we mean when we talk about uh, the revolution of 68? It's not completely obvious because at first sight there was no revolution in 68. The most revolutionary moment, the so-called uh, March of the 100,000 that took place in, in Rio on June 26th, didn't lead to any of the um, intended political consequences. Most importantly, it didn't lead um, to a subversion of the dictatorship. Quite on the contrary, it resulted in the proclamation of the infamous Institutional Act No. 5 on December 13th, a decree that, as all of you know, um, gave the president almost unlimited power and allowed for the persecution of the protesters. Clarice Lispector actually played a considerable role in this revolutionary moment, if that's what we want to call it. Um, not only did she take part in the March of the 100,000, a picture of her and uh, Chico Buarque was featured on the cover of one of the most influential newspapers at the time of Ultima Hora. So if we were to talk about revolution and politics in this immediately political sense of the word, it would be pretty obvious why I would talk about her. Because she became something like a symbol of this revolutionary moment. But this is usually not what we mean when we talk about the revolution of 1968. We usually mean a different revolution, a revolution that is also political, but in a broader sense of the word. A more cultural or countercultural revolution, a revolution in the different fields of the arts that went hand in hand with a revolution of customs or a revolution um, of the way of life. And many of the famous Brazilian artists whose names are connected to this countercultural revolution also took part in the March of the 100,000. They were, of course, not opposed to overthrowing the dictatorship 
and giving the power to the people, um, whatever that means. But I think they were skeptical towards the idea that politics can be reduced to some sort of class struggle. This skepticism um, didn't make them any less revolutionary or even apolitical, because I think at least in their self-perception, um, they thought to be, um, they thought they were even more revolutionary than the classical left. The anthropophagic revolution that the title of this conference um, alludes to was imagined to be bigger than the French Revolution, to quote Oswald Jandraj, who invented the term and who many of the Brazilian artists involved in 68 considered something like their godfather. The revolution they imagined was not just more universal than the revolution their Marxist contemporaries envisioned, it was also more specific. That means more appropriate to the political situation in Brazil. They thought that the class antagonism in post-colonial Brazil was intertwined with other more, let's say, cultural forms of oppression, with um, specific forms of racism and sexism, to be more precise. And they thought that this complex of oppression could not be dissolved by a revolution in the classical sense of the word. Um, the envisioned anthropophagic revolution would be more plural and self-critical. It would be a revolution by the means of art, and it would also be a revolution of art itself. Strangely enough, Clarice Lispector didn't seem to take part in this countercultural revolution at all. For some reason, she seemed to be chickening out on the anthropophagic revolution. I say strangely because her writing has always been considered revolutionary. Strangely also because she seemed to be aware, she seemed to be aware of and also care about um, the injustice um, in her society. But her writing still does not seem to be political. Quite on the contrary, it appears to be mystical, hermetic, and especially apolitical. An appearance that was hardly ever questioned by her interpreters. In a very short text called Literature and Justice, she seems to justify this apolitical character of her work. She claims, I quote, um, what I wanted was to do something, as if writing was not doing. What I can't manage is to use writing for that. But does this statement really prove the apolitical character of her work, as it was suggested by one very influential interpreter? I think what it proves is that she didn't mind being thought of as an apolitical writer, as a mystical and hermetic writer. And she didn't even mind people thinking that she chickened out, that she was apolitical because she was too afraid. She didn't mind being seen as a chicken, but let us not forget that the chicken, according to her own words, is the egg's disguise, and that the egg, for now, will always be revolutionary. But what makes me think that her apolitical self-presentation is just a disguise? To start with, let's take a closer look at her explanation for why she cannot use her writing for justice. I quote again from the same short text called Literature and Justice. Um, the problem of justice is in me a feeling so obvious and so basic that I can't surprise myself with it. And without surprising myself, I cannot write. And also because for me, writing is searching. The feeling of justice was never a search for me. It never had to be discovered. And what astounds me is that it is not just as obvious for everyone. What a strange, what a dubious explanation, I would say. She says that she can't write about the problem of justice because the feeling of justice is too obvious to her and fails to surprise her. Of course, writing about your own personal feeling of justice wouldn't make up for a very exciting text. And writing about your own feeling of justice 
would probably do the problem of justice a very bad service. But then she says that she doesn't just find it surprising, but even astounding that this feeling isn't as obvious for everyone else. So this, this problem of justice, that is far more interesting than her personal feeling of justice, could very well be something that she's searching and writing for. Maybe this is a hint for her more attentive readers that this problem of justice is, pre is precisely what she's using her writing for and what she's disguising herself for. But let's see, there is more evidence to be collected. For the longest time of her life, Clarice Lispector accepted and, and actively um, presented a certain image of herself. She was both the subject and the object of a sort of mystification. According to this image, she was maybe personally involved in the protests of 68, at least briefly, but she never used her writing for any political purpose. On the contrary, her writing appears to be something like a mystical quest for some unspeakable truth. In her later years, this enigmatic image increasingly included her personality too. She seemed to be less interested in political things and appeared more like an eccentric or mysterious lady. She even participated in the first World Congress of Sorcery. This is actually a very interesting story. I don't really have the time to tell it, but if you ask me about it, I will tell it. Um, anyway, in short, she presented herself and her work as mysterious, enigmatic, mystical, and apolitical. But she also never stopped to give hints that this self-presentation was nothing but a disguise. As you've already noticed, I want to suggest that she presented herself in that way for political reasons. Political in a broad and maybe strange sense of the word. I even think that the disguise was essential to her own politics. It allowed her to be read throughout the entire political spectrum and it allowed her to work and publish freely during the time of the dictatorship. It allowed her to be political and even revolutionary without being committed to any existing political party or revolution or to any specific concept of politics. It's hard to tell whether she didn't want to use her writing for any kind of politics because she was afraid or because most or even all concepts of politics and revolution seemed too narrow to her. At a certain point of her life, shortly before her death, I think she seems to have been afraid of something else. She seems to have been afraid that her disguise was too perfect, that her hints might go unheard and that she might die and her politics will remain completely in the dark and therefore ineffectual. So she did something that she has never done before. She decided to give an interview on national television. It's very famous, I think you all know it. Um, at first sight, the interview seems to have happened completely by chance. It happened very spontaneously. She was already at the TV station for a different purpose when the director of the um, TV station asked her for a personal interview. When she agreed, it was a big surprise to everyone and every, everything had to be set up within hours. Neither the TV station nor the journalist who was going to interview her were prepared for this unique opportunity. But Clarice Lispector, she was prepared. She went on air for a reason. She had something to say and she was determined to say it. She had something to say about the political dimension of her work. And because she was well prepared and determined, it was her and not the interviewer who composed the entire interview. Throughout the entire 15 minutes, she directs the interviewer with such mastery and subtlety that the interview is almost as dense and composed as one of her greatest texts. When the interviewer at, at one point asks her what she considers to be the role of the writer in contemporary Brazil, she gives a remarkable answer. She says, I quote, to speak as little as possible. What a strange claim especially from a writer who has published a considerable amount of books, articles and short stories and who is just speaking on national television. Maybe she doesn't mean that her role isn't to remain silent in general, 
Maybe she means that she only has to remain silent on the role of the writer, on her own role in society. But even on this question, she doesn't remain completely silent. She says something, as little and as concealed as possible, only as much and as explicit as necessary. The answer I quoted is the last in a series of answers in which she says something about her role in society. Not much, of course, only as much as necessary and only as explicit as necessary. It all starts when the interviewer asks her, I quote, do you consider yourself a popular writer? Her answer is simply no. Slightly perplexed, he asks her why she doesn't consider herself a popular writer. And she answers, well, I'm considered to be hermetic. How can I be hermetic and popular at the same time? Good question, I would say. And even better, she forces the interviewer to ask her about the supposed hermeticism. And her answer to this question is, in my opinion, the reason why she's giving the entire interview. So when he asks her, do you think you're hermetic? She says, I quote, I understand myself, so I am not hermetic for myself. But what does that mean? And why does she say what she says? I think she's trying to say, I understand myself. If I seem hermetic or enigmatic or mystic or apolitical to you, then it is because you don't understand me because you don't understand my politics and you don't understand what politics means to me. You can only understand me if you understand that I only disguise myself as apolitical and if you understand why I disguise myself that way. And this is not all she says. It's not the end of her answer. After claiming that she's not hermetic for herself, she stares into the camera, a very dramatic pause, and then she says, I quote, Actually, there's one story of mine that I also don't understand very well. That story is called The Egg and the Chicken. This is obviously a lie. She's lying all the time during the interview. Of course she understands that story very well. She's lying so blatantly that the audience is almost forced to question her sincerity. To be more precise, she's lying in two different ways. On the one hand, She's lying about factual things, about her origin, her name, and so on, which she, by the way, does on various occasions, um, in order to keep up and even fuel her mysterious image. But on the other hand, and more importantly, she's lying about her role in society, but this time not to keep up, but to question her mysterious image. And she's pushing the audience to question her appearance even more with her next answer. When the interviewer asks her if she considers one of her works her dearest child, she again says, ah, the egg and the chicken, which is a mystery to me. Nothing new, nothing new so far. But then she adds another text, a quote, a thing that I wrote about a gangster, a criminal, called Minerinho, who was shot 13 times when one shot was enough. When the interviewer then goes on to ask her what aspect of this brutal police murder that this story is referring to was so important to her, she begins the answer by saying, I don't remember very well, it's been a long time. Well, before we get into the rest of the answer, we should be surprised or maybe even astounded for a moment. Isn't it surprising that among all of her work, among all her great books, she's choosing two very short texts to be here dearest children. One that she claims not to understand and another that she claims not to remember. Minerinho, the other text she mentions, is referring to a horrible and at the same time typical case of police brutality in Brazil. But the reader doesn't get much information about the case except that Minerinho wasn't innocent, that he actually was a criminal and a danger to society and that he was shot 13 times, where one shot was enough. The text is more about the reaction and the reflection that the story triggers in the narrator. Reflecting on the case that she just read about in the newspaper, the narrator, presumably a white middle-class woman in Rio, comes to think about law and justice, about law in general, and especially about what she calls the first law 
the commandment, thou shall not kill. This law is the greatest assurance to the narrator. It is the foundation for all human culture, for everything that humans gained from cultivating the land, from settling down and building a house. It is the foundation for all safety and for all justice. Cultivation is only possible because people don't want to be killed and don't want to kill each other. To establish this law that, I quote, protects the irreplaceable body and life is the first step in, in cultivating the land. Maybe the feeling of justice from the other text I quoted, this feeling that fails to surprise her, is nothing but the, the assurance of this feeling of safety provided by the first law, by the first law, thou shall not kill. Your house is safe, it will protect you from killing and being killed. But something about this feeling of safety is artificial and fake. The price that we, the cultivated people, have to pay for our feeling of security is that we are, I quote, essential phonies. The Portuguese word here is sonsu, which refers to someone who hides their flaws and pretends to be innocent, or to someone who wants to hide their intentions and pretends to be a fool. Allow me to quote a few more lines from, from that same text. For my house to function, I demand as my primary duty that I be a phony, that I not exercise my revolt and my love. If I am not a phony, my house trembles. I must have forgotten that beneath the house is the land, the ground upon which a new house might be erected. Meanwhile, we sleep and falsely save ourselves until 13 gunshots wake us up. The 13 gunshots wake her up one by one, but this awakening is also her death. I quote again, this is, this is the law, but there's something that if it makes me hear the first and the second gunshots with the relief of safety, at the third puts me on the alert, at the fourth unsettles me, the fifth and sixth cover me in shame, the seventh and eighth I hear it with my heart pounding in horror, at the ninth and tenth my mouth is quivering, at the eleventh I say God's name in fright, at the twelfth I call my brother, the thirteenth shot murders me, because I am the other, because I want to be the other. She wants to be the other, but, but what does that mean? What do you want when you want to be the other? The 13 gunshots wake her up from her quiet sleep, free her from her false safety, and she claims to be free. But free to do what? What is it she wants when she wants to be the other? In this short text, Minadinho, she gives uh, three answers. The first answer is, I don't want this house. It's important to pay attention to the exact words here. She doesn't say, I don't want the house in general. I don't want culture. I want some kind of nature as opposed to culture. No, she doesn't want this house, but maybe a different house. Which leads us uh, straight to the last answer she gives. In fact, the very ending of the short text. I quote, what I want is much rougher and more difficult. I want the land. Clarice Lispector's entire work um, seems to revolve around this uh, theme. All of her great books seem to express this longing for something raw and wild, for some sort of vibrant life. Um, she calls it, among other things, the land, the plasma, the neutral or the placenta throughout different books. But it is not so clear what this supposed return to life or nature really means. Is it a quest for a mystical union, a movement toward God, or a, I quote, search for that mystic word that has its own light, like one influential interpreter suggested? Is it the dissolving of the I into some kind of raw and undifferentiated dimension of life that is somehow prior to all culture and politics? I don't think so. But I think that this idea is at the very core of a great part of the interpretations and comments on her work. It is also at the heart of her latest biography, 
which I'm afraid is um, very likely to, to shape the image of her work in the English and German speaking world throughout the next decades. So if my presentation sounds a little bit like an intervention, it's not because I want to establish a predominant reading or something like that, um, but because I want to, I don't want this mystical reading to become completely dominant. And I think the reason she gave the famous interview I was quoting is to point at the possibility of a different reading. When she points to these two short texts, The Egg and the Chicken and Minarinu, she wants to give her audience a hint at a different reading of her work. But let's see, between the first answer, I don't want this house, and the last answer, I want the land, she gives the longest and most interesting answer. An answer that serves as an explanation for the other two. She says, I quote, Oh no, I don't have that as a quote. Okay. Um, I want a justice that would have given a chance to something pure and full of helplessness in Minadinho. Further down, she calls it, a, I quote, a slightly madder justice. It's important to notice that she doesn't call for madness, just for a slightly madder justice. A justice that would, I quote again, take into account that we all must speak for a man driven to despair because in him human speech has already failed. He's already so mute that only a brute incoherent cry serves as a signal. The justice she wants is, I quote, above all, a justice that would examine itself. A justice maybe that would examine our feeling of justice that lets us sleep quietly. A justice that, I quote, does not forget that we are all dangerous. I think there is no mysticism at all here. I think this becoming other and this return to the land has nothing to do with any sort of mystic unification. She doesn't want to dissolve the otherness into unity. She doesn't want to overcome the separation between the I and the other. She wants another justice and another house. A justice that tries to do justice to the other instead of just giving herself a comforting feeling of justice. And a house that is more open to the other and not just a protection against the land. The reason that she wants to become the other is not that she wants to stop being herself, that she wants to dissolve into some kind of oneness with the other. She wants to allow, she wants to allow for the otherness, which may be the only thing capable of disturbing the false safety of her quiet sleep. This kind of revolution is a quiet revolution. The more this slightly madder justice presents itself, the, mo the more it turns into the self-righteous feeling of justice she wanted to get away from. So maybe Clarice Lispector has been using her writing for this problem of justice all the time. Maybe she's been using it for a certain revolution in the house and of the house. And maybe that's why the story The Egg and the Chicken, in which she's trying to give a hint at her politics, is set in the house. The first sentence of the story reads, in the morning, in the kitchen, on the table, I see the egg. This is the scene of the revolution. In the house, in the kitchen, a woman, a mother, is preparing breakfast eggs for her children. And while she's perform performing this seemingly profane task, she has a very strange sort of epiphany. All of a sudden, the egg seems to open up a new world. I think it's not very surprising that her feminist readers, especially Hélène Sixou, were the first to get the hint, were the first to understand the political dimension of this epiphany and of her work in general. There's something specifically feminine about her work, at least if we understand the word feminine the way Hélène Sixou does. Sixou would even go as far as to say that Clarice Lispector was the feminine writer par excellence. Maybe she would even say that she was the only one. It is a strange coincidence that the text, The Egg and the Chicken, that gives the strongest hint at the political or feminine uh, dimension of her work, strangely evokes another text. It strangely, it strangely seems to hint at the short and very influential essay, The Thing, by Martin Heidegger. The author that 
Hélène Sixou would consider the masculine thinker par excellence. In this text, he describes or presents a similar kind of epiphany, but in a very different setting. In his text, the scene is set outside, on the land and in the open, and the thing is not an egg, but a jar. Someone, a man, it has to be a man, probably a thinker, a philosopher, is pouring wine from the jar onto the ground as a, as a kind of sacrificial offering to the gods. This sacred act opens up a new world. I would never go as far as to say that the most important text of Clarice Lispector is a response to this text by Heidegger, but it is an interesting coincidence that at one point in her text, she very abruptly raises the question, I quote, is the egg basically a jar? And the answer is, to this very surprising question is short and simple, no. Although they almost look like polar opposites, these two texts, one by a philosopher, the other by a poet, they have one thing in common. Both Heidegger and Lispector talk about a thing, but they say something about their work. It's not a thing, but their own work that in their eyes will or will not open a new world. Both the egg and the jar serve as a disguise. Heidegger suggests that something truly revolutionary, a true revolution, which he famously calls an event, cannot be produced by mankind. It can only happen to man. To a man, when he leaves the house, when he's out in the open, exposed to his destiny and sacrificing the produce of the cultivation of the land. But in truth, Heidegger only pretends to go out. He never sacrifices his own work to some kind of event, to some kind of radical revolution that is produced by something radically other from his work. In truth, he stays in the house and the supposed event is nothing that just happens but something he tries to produce with his own work. In truth, he wants to burn down the house and he wants everyone to think it was destiny. Why I'm saying this is because I think with Clarice Lispector, the disguise works the other way around. She only pretends to stay at home, where in truth, she goes out to the land where she's really performing a sacrifice. Let me quote another short passage from the, from the text. She writes, the egg is the chicken's great sacrifice. The egg is the cross the chicken, the chicken bears in life. The egg is the chicken's unattainable dream. The chicken loves the egg. She doesn't know the egg exists. Everything she writes about the chicken and the egg sounds hermetic and strange. The story is almost, is almost like a fable except that it isn't about human relations in general. It is about her relation with, with her audience. And what follows from it is no general moral doctrine, but an invitation to read her in a different way. I suggest that in this famous story, the chicken stands for her self-presentation as a mysterious author who is writing hermetical texts that she claims not to understand nor to remember. The chicken, or the self-presentation, allow the egg, the thing that she really cares about, the problem of justice, to, to traverse the ages. The chicken, Clarice Lispector writes, exists so that the egg can use the chicken. The narrator of the story stands for her readership, at least for the more attentive part of her audience. So when the narrator states, I quote, I look at the egg in the kitchen with superficial attention so as not to break it. I take the utmost care not to understand it. The author makes a suggestion, or rather an invitation. What I'm really writing for is not something that can be understood like a moral doctrine, something that you can have and act upon, something that gives you the fake security of a feeling of justice. I can give you no assurance no clear answer to the question what is to be done. I cannot tell you what to do. Yes, I want a different house, but I don't know whether that means burning it down or building a new one, or whether that just means leaving the door open. So what's the lesson of this fable? The narrator says, 
I don't understand the egg. I only understand a broken egg. I crack it on the frying pan, and in this indirect way, I give myself to the egg's existence. My sacrifice is reducing myself to my personal life. Maybe the, the lesson goes something like that. Go out in the open, go savor the land, or the neutral, or the placenta, or less metaphorically, go read my work. Go let the safety of your existence, of your opinions and actions, and of your feeling of justice be questioned. And finally, go back to the house and do what you need to do. But with a different, maybe more self-critical attitude. So when Clarice Lispector goes on television and is asked how her work is changing the way things are, she simply answers, I quote, it changes nothing, it changes nothing. And she didn't just say that because she's afraid of persecution. She's not just chickening out in that sense. When the interviewer asks her why she even keeps on writing then, her answer is a truth and a lie at the same time. She says, I don't know, because at the end of the day, we're not trying to change things. We're trying to open up somehow. Thank you very much.